as we come to the Word of God, which is going to be from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, we rejoice that we're among the people on the earth who have access to Scripture. And we know that God works in the reading and the preaching of the Word. And so today's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. We have heard the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A Liturgy of Hope for Messy Lives. Today I want to talk to you about what is literally a cornerstone of our faith and serves as the foundation for our liturgy. Some of us, like me, did not grow up in a liturgical church. A liturgical worship service takes on certain rhythms during the church year. We start with Advent, then Christmas, then Epiphany, then Lent, and Holy Week, Pentecost, All Saints. So we follow that rhythm through the year, but each Sunday there are several pieces that we can always expect to find in the liturgy. And when you are first exposed to a church with a liturgical pattern, you begin to see that the form really doesn't change that much. Some people like it, some people don't, but I personally love the fact that each week I can expect to pray the Lord's Prayer together, sing the Gloria Patri, receive a benediction, sing the doxology, and hear the assurance of pardon. Obviously, not in that order. Our worship service, as you may know, has three parts. It's the welcome of God, the word of God, and then our response to God. You've heard me talk about this recently. <clears throat> Uh, right now, we are in the middle with the Word of God. We have heard the Word read, and now I am proclaiming it to you. And after this, we are going to have the uh, opportunity to respond to the compassion of God that we're going to learn about. So, in that moment when we respond to God, in the last third of our worship service, we respond by offering our gifts and our generosity, our prayers for ourselves and for others, and then at the end, we leave with a benediction. And that benediction is actually very, very important. And a benediction is not merely just a fancy theological, religious way to say goodbye. As you may know, the word benediction comes from the Latin word that literally means to say well. That is, to wish someone well. But this wishing someone well doesn't just show up at the end of the worship service. God speaking well of us and wanting our own good is actually underneath all the parts of the liturgy. Friends, I know that you need to hear this. God wishes you well. God wants you to experience good. God does not wish to condemn, shame, or guilt you. We do not have a liturgy of shame we have a liturgy of hope. And I want to talk more about that because our liturgy and our sense of God speaking well of us is actually cutting across the grain of what many people think of Christianity. Many people think of Christianity as a condemning, shaming religion. But our liturgy our faith is one of hope and not despair. It is one of grace and not guilt. So, like I mentioned, the first part of our worship service is the call of God. 
like a school bell that chimes to signal to students and teachers that they should gather themselves together for a specific reason, the call to worship or the call of God or the welcome of God is a call for us to gather for a specific purpose. Now let me ask you a question. <clears throat> when we gather together, when we come, how do we come? Do we come 100% happy? Do we come having it all figured out? Do we come having slayed all the dragons in our life? No. We come having lived in a messy, complex world. We come having made mistakes. And if you'll allow, let's get real for a second. Otherwise, you can fast forward for about 30, 30 seconds. But let's get real. You come having lost your temper, even after you made a vow that you wouldn't let certain issues get under your skin. You prejudged a person or an issue, even though you want to be an open-minded person. You come having evaded issues in your life that needed tending to. And you come with worries and you come with heartache. And you come having done good and kind deeds. You have come having helped someone or doing something that no one else knows about that made the community stronger and better. And you come having nursed old grudges, reliving our anger towards someone. Listen, that's true of me as well. You and I both come to worship having lived messy lives in a messy world. But often the struggle is not just our failings or shortcomings. That's only half the battle, as if the battle's not hard enough. The other half is deciding how we are going to respond to our failings and our shortcomings. Are we going to despair? Or will we be moved by hope that pushes us toward change? So we gather ourselves together as a messy people who fortunately come to a merciful God. After our initial call to worship, we sing a hymn of praise. And listen, we are not just singing about God, but we are singing to God. And we are singing to one another about God. What we are enacting in that time, what we are living out, it's, it's like we're saying, hey, other messy people, we realize that we are a mess, but let's gather together for a certain purpose because God has a message for us. Now, let's sing this song and pay attention to how compassionate, holy, kind, loving, and committed God is to us, even in our mess. And that song leads us to the opportunity to tell the truth. It's a time that we give words to our messiness and not just feelings of guilt. We reflect upon uh, what we have sung about. We reflect about what we have sung to one another about God. And we say, yes, I want more of that to show up in my life. I want that good, kind light of God to shine on the path of my life so that I can be a better person. And I know that I need God's help to do that. And immediately following the confession, the truth-telling, we are assured that God does not abandon us. Our mess messiness does not catch God off guard. No, instead, God comes to us with grace and wisdom and through the work of the Spirit empowers us to change. Often we change over time, not overnight. This is a liturgy of hope. This passage from the Gospel of Matthew grounds us in this reality. It's not a good, made-up, emotionally fuzzy thing that's recently appeared in our theology or in our liturgy. God speaking well of us, not shaming us, was actually taught by Jesus. Here, Jesus refers to himself in this passage as the Son of Man. Now, this is a synonym for the Messiah, or the one who would be sent of God to redeem the world, and to demonstrate God's commitment to compassion and renewal. And there are two major points here, who Jesus is and what Jesus is here to do. And the first part of our passage is about who Jesus is. 
He is not one of the prophets. He is not John the Baptist. He's not Elijah. He's not Jeremiah. He's not a prophet. Actually, he is the, what the prophets were teaching about. He is what the prophets were pointing to. He is what the prophets were hoping for. He is the Messiah, as Peter says. And who he is, Lord, Messiah, child of the living God, tells us what he's here to do. So let me ask you something. What on earth is Jesus here to do? Well, if you think about that, you might come up with a list of 20, 30, 40, perhaps even more things that would be very, very important and true. But I think that what I would like to share with you today is one of these things, and it comes from another gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. In that, we read, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So, when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we need to connect that to John chapter 3, that God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn us, but to lift us up, to save us from ourselves through his life. So, uh, Peter is connecting Christ with divine compassion. He is connecting Christ with grace and commitment. He is connecting Christ with God's benediction of us and the renewal of us in our world. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Friends, we have a God of hope. We have a Savior of hope. We have a faith that is all about hope. So think of it this way. Think of it this way. The question is, if we want to win both battles, right, facing our shortcomings, but then how are we going to respond when we realize that we failed or we realize our shortcomings? How are we going to respond? Well, easily said, it's this. We are to follow the example that God sets for us. And what example did God set for us? Redemption, hope being grounded in God's commitment to help us. God is not committed to condemn us. God is committed to help us. Peter's connection in his confession is the key to all of Christianity. Jesus responds, Peter, what you just said is the point to how the church will survive any assault of evil. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, he says, Peter, Peter, on this rock. Well, what's the rock? What's the rock? No, Peter is not the rock. Some people think he's the rock. He's not the rock. The church is not the rock. No religious person and no religious edict is the rock. Your performance is not the rock. Perfectionism is not the rock. Other people's opinion of us is not the rock. Our retirement accounts are not the rock. Theological checkboxes are not the rock. Who Jesus is and what Jesus was here to do is the rock. And it is upon Jesus we will be built up. So in this passage, Jesus isn't pointing to Peter as the rock. He's pointing to the truth that Peter is confessing. Who Jesus is and what Jesus is here to do. Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus is here to do, is the rock upon which we are built. When we falter, it is the rock that will be under us, giving us yet again a firm foundation from which to rebuild. That's the truth. That is the truth. And in this passage, we have this amazingly strong assurance. If we are forgiven on earth, which we are, then we could be assured that we are forgiven in heaven, in the very presence of God. When we realize our shortcomings, friends, we can be assured that God still benedicts us, that God still speaks well of us. This means that we do not have to live with ongoing shame and guilt. It's forgiven once and forever. Now, let me close but let me encourage you. Let's put this to practice. <clears throat> Think about your life. 
Notice what you did well. Notice your mistakes and what you'd like to do better. Learn from your mistakes. Allow God to join you in your mistakes. As a friend shared with me this week, let your mess be a message. Let your mess be a message. I'm starting to think that that should have been the title of this sermon. Let your mess be a message. So when you realize your mess, remember the message of our liturgy. Hope, assurance, grace, compassion, fidelity, unending commitment of God. That's our faith. Let your mess be a message that teaches you, that helps you, that lifts you up instead of pushing you down and pushing you away. So to use the image from this passage, when you need to go somewhere uh, because you want to learn from your mistakes, you want to get better and you, you want to live a joyful faith, well, someone has the keys and the door is open because God is open to you. That's why I can say without hesitation at the beginning of our worship service every time, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your life or your faith, you're welcomed here and you're welcomed into the presence of God. The door is open. God is open. We have somehow gotten it into our faith and into our entire uh, system of belief that God is out to condemn us. When the very gospel of John chapter 3 says, God did not send Jesus to condemn, but to save, to help, to deliver us. Listen, when you realize your mess, you are given the opportunity to experience God's grace once again. God doesn't push away. God doesn't push down. God reaches out to bring you close. And that's what we're celebrating each Sunday when we worship together. It doesn't matter if we are in person or if we are remote via recording. This is our celebration. This is our liturgy. This is our hope. So let's respond to this wonderful liturgy of hope.